Hello. Ah, oh, it's not right, is it? God, it's been a while. Ah, hey there, Dan Gastu here. Today's video is about restoring a timber trawler and is proudly sponsored by MarineEngine.com. I call this video the ultimate trawler restoration because in many ways, I believe it is. When people traditionally restore a trawler, they tend to clear the fishing gear off and then extend the wheelhouse back over the aft deck. You know, they might put a bit of a kitchenette in or something, but that's kind of about it. Obviously some rooms downstairs, somewhere to sleep. Uh, this particular project goes a lot further than that. And that's what I think makes it quite special. I haven't been doing many videos lately because I'm back in the office five days a week at the moment. Uh, and it turns out that this particular boat belongs to one of my bosses, Peter. To make things a little bit more confusing, uh, one of my other bosses is called Pete, who comes along. So Peter, Pete and I head on a road trip to go and check the boat out. While I was down at the lakes, I bumped into Norm from Motor Sailing for Old Dudes. He was kind enough to do some filming for us, starting with an introduction to Peter. Okay, so this is Peter, the owner of your boat, and your boat name is? That's the Lisa Ann. Lisa Ann, yeah. okay. And uh, you are doing a big reconstruction project yeah, on absolutely. it. Absolutely, reconstruction. Yeah. And, and definitely in love with it? Yeah, look, it's been a bit of a love-hate relationship, but it's tending more towards love at the moment. Uh, <laughs> starting to look, um, starting to look good. Yeah. Okay, let's go and have a look, Peter. Okay, great. All right, let's not jump the gun and look at the boat yet. Uh, the day actually started with Pete and I heading into the city to go to work, and then staying in the city to head off early in the morning. This gave us a chance to chat with Peter about the boat before we jumped in the car. Here we are, off to work, doing a documentary. Dear Wood, Stuart and Peter are in the city. Here we are at the Conservatorium of Music, Peter's first place of employment when he came to Australia. It was at an old stables. Looks like they got a marquee on top. Fantastic. It's a relatively short walk from the car park to the office. Certainly a nice walk on a, on a sunny day. Good chance to see the sights of Sydney for a change. Get off Dango Island. The boat's a McLaren. It is. That's right. Yes. And when was it built? Where was it built? Well, it was um, Bob McLaren built his boats in Ballina. Yep. Uh, from the sort of early 60s through to the 80s. Mm -hmm. uh, he built, built 52 boats. Oh, wow. Yeah. Okay. And uh, look, we, we've, we've, we've been told, although it hasn't been confirmed, that this was the last boat that he built. Mm -hmm in the boat yard, so that would have made it sort of mid-80s. Um, so he'd refined his art by then? Hopefully, yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Hopefully uh, we sort of, you know, they, they get improved. Yeah, got the different. pinnacle. Uh, but my, from my, um, the information I've had is that McLaren's are fairly highly regarded in, mm -hmm. in the trawler land. Yep. So given that um, it was going to be a big job, the restoration, we needed to start with something that was worth it. Yes. That was quite important. Yeah, no, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. So built Barna and then, but worked Sydney. Well, I know it worked um, out of Sydney. I know it worked out of Pitwater because there's an article in the Pitwater Times <laughs> um, that, um, that actually talks about the boat. Uh, I know it worked out of the fish markets in Sydney because there is a plaque in the fish market that talks about the owner of the boat right. and the boat, um, you know, working out of Sydney. It was then sold to someone in the Lakes area, in Gippsland Lakes. Yep and it fished the Bass Strait out of Lake Sentence. Oh, OK, so it was working down there as well, yeah. yeah. Yes. All right. And when I bought it, it was down in Lake Sentence. Yes. Yes. Gotcha. The original idea was to, you know, fix it, the boat up to a good enough level to get it back to Sydney to do the restoration. Uh, because I'm in Sydney and I wanted to be close to it. So we're driving there, we've just left Nimitabel. It's inimitable. <laughs> indomitable. <laughs> indomitable. We are now heading... Uh, well, south basically, due south, southeast, according to south of the car. Yeah, another four hours probably, probably, I would think four hours to Lake Entrance. Depends on what we spend at the brewery. <laughs> What's the brewery called? Dave? Sailor's Grave. Sailor's Grave. Brewery. Sailor's Grave, right. and some famous honeys as well. Sounds quite auspicious. Yeah, it's called Stu. Uh, well, this is Brown Mountain, I think. Brown Mountain, Mountain. descending yeah. Brown Mountain. That's like a joke. Ask who? Bucket Joe. Bucket Joe. Bucket Joe. That's where Steve used to live. Down we go. I think he was Bucket Joe. 
he grew up. It was at this exact moment that Peter woke up in the back and said this. From our other channel. You know we're not going to big are they? Where are we going? We're turning right. We've got a, some clearing going on here. It's quite, it's quite depressing, isn't it? Ooh. Now, I'm going to pretend to be really underwhelmed. You get a close up of his face. <laughs> <laughs> here it is. Smaller than I thought, but it's a tidy little boat. Oh, wait a minute. Stu getting a good look under there, that's Justin. Really hot bed of activity. And it's gonna be amazing. We got there on the Friday when Justin and Mark were busy working on the boat along with their apprentices. Uh, we had a good look around, it was nice to meet the guys but uh, they kindly agreed to come in and give us some time on the Saturday to actually pick their brains and interview them. So a uh, huge thank you guys for giving up a bit of your weekend to help make this video. Here we have the work in progress. Stuart talking to Justin, the shippy. Norm there having a chat with Mark. I've done it. The other shippy. Down there's the old engine bay and the new engine bay. Going all the way to the back. The last one That's where we're at. Yes. How are you going? Good. Uh, so Justin is the principal at Van Abel Shipwrights, and you're essentially the main man in charge of this whole project. Yeah, yeah, leading it on. Um, it's going quite well. A lot to go. Done a lot. Done yeah, a lot. Yeah. yeah. So. Yeah, so I haven't seen, we'll put, obviously put photos in this video, I haven't seen any of the before shots yet, so I'm really looking forward to seeing yeah. how far it has come. Yeah, yeah, it's been a lot of work. She was quite um, deteriorated in here because of the fish room and, and that sort of stuff. Yeah. And yeah, so all the ribs are not rotted, but decayed. Yes. Yeah, yeah. turned to compost. So. Yeah, right. Yeah. Pretty. And you replaced, so you've already replaced quite a lot of ribs? Yeah, we did, I think, in the end, we ended up replacing like 115 ribs. Wow. Um, probably a good quarter of the uh, the planks, and mm -hmm. then also repaired a lot of planks and spline seams as well. Mm -hmm. um, some of the stringers have been replaced, but all the stringer bolts have been have been done. Um, new engine beds have gone in and bolted, keel bolts checked, um, and then you know. Random repair work here, there, and everywhere. Yeah, yeah, with yeah. what you find, a bit of worm damage yeah. in the back of the keel, and right. up in the stem. So yeah, yeah, just yeah. The bore is a big one for wooden boats, isn't it? You yeah. sort of go rock, but suddenly you just get this big hole straight through. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So it wasn't too bad. It's quite yeah. localized, but yes, um, you know, you get it in these gills. Um, yeah. yeah. So boat was balling it, but obviously here we are at yep. uh, Gippsland Lakes. Specifically, we're now. Um, in uh, Painesville, Painesville yeah. and it seems like a huge area for boating. Like it's yeah. Well, the Gibson Lakes is um, it's been well renowned for um, being the, the boating capital of Victoria, mm -hmm. um, and then the trades and everything that are in the area definitely support that. Mm -hmm. um, that's what I like about this area is the the quality of trades for the yeah, small town right. like Painesville, Bairnsdale Lake Lakes entrance. It's mm -hmm. um, got a big fishing fleet in Lakes entrance, which suits this boat quite well because essentially being converted, she's still got the gear of a fishing boat, yeah. edgings, charves, rudders and all that sort of stuff. Yeah. So the same having that there, you know, that's what they do and so uh, yeah. 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 And so you started the project out at Lake Centres because I had a bigger Silkway travel lift? Yeah, so Gippsland Ports is where we're at and they've been extremely uh helpful. But being the size that she is, we had mm -hmm. to come out of the water at Lakes where they've got a hundred ton travel lift. Right, well. <laughs> and put us on the hard there. There is a hundred and twenty ton slipway here but it's a lot easier to work on flat ground than on yeah, a cradle. On a cradle. Yeah. And then I guess also, uh, you know, you're taking up the slipway the whole time you're working too. Yeah, right? yeah, we're out of the water for, I think, end up being seven months, mm -hmm. um, getting all the ribbing and planking done. It was a, quite a large process. Um, can't remember how many kilos of nails we put in, but I do remember that, oh, she got completely recorked as well, yeah. Yeah. Um, top sides and underneath and, Went through like 70 kilos with a linseed putty. Yeah. So uh, it's good training for the apprentices. <laughs> <laughs> You're going to go to Suss by now. Yeah, yeah. They, they, they learned how to be pretty quick at it. Yeah, so. yeah. That's, um, let's get this started. Yeah, yeah that's cool. Mm. So, um, how about, and also just, I know there's a big thing about wooden boats being out of the water. Like, how long can a wooden boat let's be out of the water for before you start to. Uh, it's a, it's a, yeah. 
Depends on the boat. You want to you want to kind of limit you want to limit the amount of time, and if it's extended period, you want to try and be in the cooler months. Yes. So you know anything up to two weeks is fine. Mm. You know you'll get seams that leak and everything, but they do go back. Yeah, it'll take. Um, them in a job like this, um, because we we're recorking her completely and mm. renewing the whole hull, it wasn't such a big issue. But then you start getting into, like we were saying, we're out for seven months. If you start pushing that into two years, you start, the keel starts shrinking and, yeah. and then things start to, to happen and you've yeah. got to be a bit more careful about yeah. it. So some of the engineering stuff around moving the motor backwards was very interesting. The engine was where we were. Yeah, the engine was. And now it's got to be at least five metres back. Something like that. I yeah. never measured how much further back. Yeah, yeah the, um, I was driving home from work and the client rang me up and goes, I've, I've had an idea. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I've learned that when he says, I have an idea, it's always something good. <laughs> You're breaking up. Yeah. <laughs> and he goes, I want to move the engine back. I'm like, yeah, okay. And just in my head, I've kind of envisaged two or three foot. Yeah. Um, I'm like, yeah, okay. And he goes, no, I want to put the engine in the back of the boat. Like, okay. That's, yeah, all right. He goes, can we do it? Yeah, it can be done if, um, if the engine fits. Because I can't change the hull shape and I can't change the engine. Yeah. If it fits, we could do it. Yeah. So, um, yeah, it was a bit of a bit of a planning process to try and make it work. I did everything possible to have a straight shaft driven, mm -hmm. but the shape of the hull, engine, gearbox couldn't be done unless I got a, uh, a Z drive gearbox. But then that then limited shaft alignment and maintenance down further yeah. down the track. Yeah. Um, so end up going for a V drive setup. Mm -hmm. So um, that eliminates getting engine lineup because we've got a universal joint running between the two, mm -hmm. and a hefty V drive, which um, yeah, locked all Do together. the job and yeah. get all the geometry. A lot of uh... yeah, yeah. It was a, it, it took a little bit um, to get it all lined up and and worked out, but we got there in the end, and yeah, we've now got extensively long engine beds because the v-drive and the engine bed is all built into one mm -hmm. um, and that's mainly because the v-drive is taking all the thrust and so that had to be substantial in itself and the engine well she weighs 1.6 tons mm -hmm. so we've got to contain that plus rotational torque so to have them separate was a little bit silly may as well put that load through yeah. a bigger area of the yeah, vessel. yeah lock it together yeah. yeah and you're saying with regards to torque you're saying that uh, you're going for Prop rotation opposite to engine rotation? Yeah, the engineers in Lakes um, came up with that idea and I thought it was quite beautiful when he told me. So, um, have the prop rotate the opposite way to the engine mm -hmm. and that cancel out air yeah, rotational torque and also dampens down a lot of the um, harmonics in the vessel. So, uh, as soon as he told me that, I'm like, yeah, that's that's actually quite beautiful. Yeah, it yeah, works. it makes sense, doesn't it? It, it works. Um, yeah. yeah, so it takes a lot of stress out of the boat. Yeah, um, yeah, you can take it, but why put it in there if you don't have? Why to? have it? Yeah, yeah. just yeah. constantly loading one way. That's yeah. it. It's a, it must have been. I've never really heard people talk about that previously. No, I just kind of think it's a bit of a no-brainer, really. Yeah, it's, yeah. That, that yeah. it's not common that we do that. Yeah. Um, like how we have um, counter-rotating props on dual screw boats. Yeah, I'm just screw, just, yeah. Um, yeah, I think it's a, quite a quite a, uh, a good option. So. Yeah, that's interesting. And considering the V drive is our gearbox, and we rang up ZF, and there's no designated forward or reverse yeah. on it. And They're just equal. So yeah, so it, we can do whatever we want. Mm. So then there's, that's the um, the answer. And I guess that's the nice thing about such a major refit is you get the chance to really think these things through now and go, yeah. oh, let's. Let's make it better than it ever was. Yeah, and and also like that and the planning of, I really like access all areas. Yeah. So pre-plan where all your trunking is for your wiring and we've got yeah. that now. We know where that's going and the wiring and the plumbing are on opposite sides of the vessel. Mm -hmm. um, and that's all lined up with the galley and, and the heads mm -hmm. and that sort of thing. So, but then to access that, it's just panels behind the cupboard, pull the drawers yeah. out drop a panel and there's your wiring or your... Yeah, I um, can tell you've worked on a few boats where you start thinking about the poor guy that's got to fix it down the track. Or yeah, so, yeah, so, yeah, I'm usually that poor guy. Yeah, exactly. to work out how, like, to get, how do I undo that? Yeah. Well, I can undo it, but how am I meant to do it back up mm. again? Well, and particularly also uh, at sea, you know, if something happens and you're just going, oh man, like I could maybe get to that if I had my special wiggle extension adapter or whatever when yeah. you're just rocking around and you're cruising. And that's that's been part of our brief is because um, the boat's planned to do extensive offshore, mm -hmm. um, 
it is going a nice electronics package upstairs, but the we're doing we're putting a uh, Cummins N855 in her, which is right. a because it's mechanical and old and it works and it's solid and proven. Oh, so, like a Detroit, yeah, okay, yeah, gotcha. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, so if we have if we have a complete power outage, yeah. you're bound to find a battery somewhere in the system to get the engine going. Yeah. And once it's going, yeah. it will just continue to run. Yeah, um, yeah right. Uh, and you were saying before, because you've redone the whole deck, um, raise the deck. Yeah. Were you told about raising the deck before or after moving the motor back? After. Right. Yeah, so the deck was a slight issue. I knew the engine would fit, but mm -hmm. I think um, the air cleaner would have to have been adjusted. Mm -hmm. But other than that, it was it was tight, but it worked. Mm -hmm. I knew it would work. And now, raising the deck, the uh, the 300 mil, we've got ample room. Yeah, nice. Yeah, and were you nice. saying you even had made, made a bit of a mock-up to... Yeah, because um, we knew the engine fit, but then mm -hmm. the next part of the equation was how do we get it in and out? Physically get it in, um, yeah. And the design of the cabin meant that the the aft um, the aft um, end of the cabin overhung the engine, right? And then, but then, where the engine simply the engine couldn't go any further back because of the shaft lock. Mm -hmm. So then I had to think, okay, if we can't get we can't get past the back of the cabin, but we can't go any further aft because the shaft lock's there. Mm -hmm. How do we go about it? And we decided that okay, the option is let's put the engine in four chips. Yep, and spin it, spin it, and yeah. then bring it in, yeah. which sounds oh yeah that works, and but then the next thing was actually does it work? Can we spin that engine inside mm. the boat? We know it's height and width, but then the height and width includes a sump and air cleaner, and the sump's only located here, and the you know the bell housing mm -hmm. back there is a lot smaller. Yeah. So the um, naval architect printed us out a full size, and we glued that to some MDF, and yeah, wow. well, sat here with That's the string cool. and. Yeah, did our thing and yeah, yep, worked. Yeah, it worked really well. And having the hatch thwart chips as well means we've got more full length beams running yeah. across the boat for strength. Yeah, um, we've only got two half beams in there instead of five. Yeah, and nice. once the engine's in, because the hatch is wider the other way, we've got greater access to put gensets, fuel tanks, yeah. all the mechanics off to the sides. Once, the yeah, sides. that makes sense too. Yeah, yeah. so it's, it's it's worked really really well. It's like you've thought about it. <laughs> Thought about a few things. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's great. It is so nice to know that there's no, it takes the stress out of the day when it all happens, knowing I know I'm 100% sure this is going to work because I've yeah, tested it. Yeah, and also, you know, drawing the engine out and getting the V drive and all that sorted out and knowing, knowing I knew that it worked, mm -hmm. but then when we got the full size drawing, mm -hmm. we also hung that in the location of the engine yeah. once it was installed mm -hmm. and it was good. We got the digital levels out and everything, yeah. everything was where it was supposed to be. Nice. So that was you know, a good confirmation of, you know, yeah, it's, it will work. So. so how long do you think to go? A couple of weekends. Yeah. Yeah. Be, <laughs> yeah. Well, we, <laughs> With the pizza, I reckon one weekend. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so we're definitely going to go through all through next year, mm -hmm. um, and by that stage we'll be into that final mm -hmm. fiddly, time-consuming varnishy, this touch yeah. that sort of stuff. That, yeah. you know, that that little bit of a grind. The way there's going to be minimal varnish work inside, like mm -hmm. so. There's going to be like there'll be, there'll be a nice amount of timber in there. Um, but a lot of soft paneling and stuff like yeah, that, nice. uh, and that'll be quicker than painting and varnishing, yeah. and then use all the timber work as jewellery and that sort of stuff. Yeah, just to make it. Make it uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. So. But it's great to see the boat being saved. You know, so many boats get to the point where there isn't somebody willing to yeah to yeah. Uh, take the project on, and um, you know, both as an owner and as tradesman, to say no, no, let's let's give mm. this boat a new lease of life. Yeah, definitely, and that's what I love about it is that. You need someone like Pete to take these things on mm. because they're a big project, yeah. and, and there's a lot of love that's got to go in behind it. And, yeah, and yeah, it's got to be a passion, yeah. hasn't it? There's got to, there's yeah. got to be. But if it wasn't for them, they'll die. Yeah, and a lot of people said, "Oh, wouldn't it be better just to build a new one?" I'm like, well, no, because you still got the boat. Mm. Oh yeah, um, there's a lot of work in what's still lot, here. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So timber availability, how's we're how's very that? lucky there. That was one of my biggest things for Peter when uh, we we're discussing about the job and, and um, doing it down here in East Gippsland. Um, one of the biggest things was we've got a timber merchant mm -hmm. and he's just in Bansdale, which is uh, 15 minutes away. Mm -hmm. um, brilliant, you know, um, 
very helpful, very knowledgeable, and yeah, we're getting some very nice timber out of him. Yeah, perfect. He's supplied all. He's supplied everything, and with the ribbing material, he was going out to his coop, select felling, um, yellow stringy, cutting it up all back sawn for us, mm -hmm. um, and so he'd be chopping the tree down, milling it, and within five days we we're steaming it into the boat. Wow. Yeah. So we had beautiful, like four point eight meter long sticks. Nice. Um, and we broke. I think. One, we broke one and, and, and destroyed one at the very beginning and that was just that whole process of learning the timber and, yeah. and getting your size. What are its characteristics? And yeah, yeah, yeah. And um, the two biggest things were we, the, the size was right but we just had to take half a mil off the, it's in three laminations. Right. So take half a mil off each lamination gotcha. and that just made it get past the, uh, the stringers a bit easier and we needed to cook it a little bit harder or a little right. bit longer okay yeah, get just to get bit, the band yeah just to it. yeah make it a bit easier yeah. and not hit it so hard right because <laughs> <laughs> uh, when you're trying to get 4.8 meters in you start working it pretty hard but yeah we should have just slowed it down especially when she's getting to the tuck of the bilge yes um, yeah it's quite tight isn't it yeah, yeah yeah so we had to that was a bit of a so we've got three laminations running all through here mm -hmm. then we step it up to four when she starts yeah. getting tighter and right up after it's really tight with yeah. um we've gone six right on the tuck but then that goes into three up higher so, so six thinner to get yeah, more bends that's, yeah, that's the reason bend, yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, we could have gone in five but then it was a lot easier to go six into three gotcha. yeah, yeah so we steamed we steamed them in and then once they um once they're ready they all glued and nailed which was a fun process trying to glue and nail ribs together, especially six of them, there's stuff going everywhere. Yeah, right. And once that was cured, we then just staggered, when we steamed the um, the three in from the top, mm -hmm. we staggered the joints and we just hit the first one, start banging the next two in, that comes up, and then yeah, the third gotcha. one, and then yeah. that staggered over, I don't yeah. know how many planks, four or five planks. Yeah, nice. Yeah, and then that was just yeah. an easy equation, just to come in, instead yeah. of trying to get the uh, the five into three or something like that, yeah. so. And when Peter called you about raising the deck, uh, the ribs hadn't been cut yet. Yeah, were, that was, that's what let us do it. Yeah. In the yeah. end, that was the essence of any, yeah, he goes, I want to raise the deck. Okay. Um, he goes, oh, no, I don't, no, maybe not. I thought, we'll just hold on, we'll think about it for a second. Mm -hmm. And yeah, we, so about 85% mm, of the ribs that we replaced were long enough yep. that we just could plank straight up. Um, and there was just a few that we needed to to re scarf new ones into, or yeah. just you know do that same staggered method yeah. and get. But there's so many full length ones that you sort of. No, yeah, it was fine. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Exactly. It was, it was, yeah. there wasn't many to to extend to to get up to that 300. Yeah. But then the biggest bonus to it was that we could. Well, we when we when we said, oh, okay, we we can raise the deck. We started thinking about, okay, how do we go about it, and, and uh, what's the limitations or or. Um, things that need to happen and the minimum requirement was we couldn't we had to be at least 300 mm -hmm. because that allowed us to build the new deck over the over old the deck. old one yeah yes. you couldn't go much less we couldn't go any less yeah. um, because then the bonus to that is we could keep the old deck there and yeah. have the structure of the vessel yeah. and then build the new structure on top and then yeah keep the, the integrity in there yeah. and, uh, yeah, because we're always in the back of our mind going, how do we hold the shape of the vessel with no deck? Mm -hmm. And and also, like, the deck beams are about 80 kilos each. So to be manhandling that above your head and yeah. fitting it yeah. was going to be a challenge. Well, it's going to be a huge challenge. Yeah. Um, nothing's impossible, but, you know, it wasn't going to be easy. Yeah. So that allowed us to do that, you know, and put new beam shelves in and um, build the deck over the old one and just rip the deck out as we need it. And, yep, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So it sort of gave you a scaffolding safety aspect as well as yeah, and we can the integrity use, of the hull. And we can use it to prop and wedge and bang yeah. and we can screw stuff to the old deck. Yeah, to yeah exactly. Yeah. Yeah. That's what we did, putting the, the new Carlins in there, five metres long, to yeah. take their side of the cabin. Um, just making up metal frames and screw it to the old deck beams and bend and edges mm. it and work yeah. to make them work. Yeah. I love the process mm. and I look at it as just one big giant piece of Lego. Yeah. You have to make the pieces yourself. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's um, fun. It's yeah. interactive and keeps the brain. Yeah, nice. Yeah. So. Well, thank you very much for your time today. No Kicked on the weekend. Appreciate yeah. you coming down and uh, thank you. letting us uh, quiz you. Yeah, beautiful. I'm glad you And uh, we'll see you in a couple of weekends when it gets launched. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Justin. No, Thanks, Thanks.
it was great watching the team uh, ply their trade and get the boat back together, but my confidence in the project finishing faster because Pete was helping was uh, soon diminished. Yeah. So this is a bit of wood, yep. uh, and it's important that it's shaped See how it's almost a triangle? Yep. But you've got to just chop the end bit off. Yeah, right. And then once you've done that, um, you got yourself. It's not the one way. It's a bit. You sure you don't? So, yeah, the, the benefit of um, these joints you may or may not know is just because it, it keeps the cross sectional area of the beam quite large. Um, it's like, you know, you're not taking too much out of the carlin itself. Yeah, yep. Same yep. As, as where it checks into the main beams back there. Yeah, yep. Which you've probably seen before, but yeah, quite, quite. <laughs> there, there's, there's, what you were really talking about before is, you know, um, if you're going to save a boat, you know, is this the boat you would save, and is it worth saving? And as a novice to this space, literally not knowing anything about it, I think you potentially have almost, you know, a, a more view that's unfettered by any knowledge whatsoever, you know, so, so you're actually, anything goes. So ignor ignorance is a ignorance, good thing. Yeah, 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 yeah. And I think the other thing is hindsight is a good thing. So w w there's a couple of things. One is the fact that there was so much damage has enabled us to do things or forced us to do things that we wouldn't have otherwise done. Mm -hmm. So we would never have raised the deck. Absolutely. We would never have moved the engine back because you wouldn't want to ruin what was already there. But if what, if what already there doesn't work, or is in such a bad state of repair, you're actually going to put it together in a way that really makes sense as a, as a cruising boat. And I, th uh, and I think that potentially is what the action yeah. is going to be. And, and all boats evolve over their lifetimes, I believe. I mean, it still is the yeah. original boat, even though we have raised yes. the shear, yes. we have moved the engine, but it's yeah. just moved on to its its next life, which is not a, a commercial fishing boat. It's a, yes. it's a pleasure boat for yourself yes. to enjoy. Yeah. yeah, and for me it's based on... It's based on the lines of the boat. It's based on my aesthetic appreciation of. It. In other words, is this the boat you want to save? Mm. And the boat you want to save is not necessarily the best boat in in the sense of in the best condition, because the boat in the best condition may not have the the best shape, right? But to me, this is the boat should have been saved because I think the the lines of the boat, the original builder, I think McLaren is very highly regarded. Um, so I'm pretty happy with, with what we're doing, yeah. Mm -hmm. no, okay. All right. This is a uh, December rain rock video. <laughs> Where's the uh, air gun? <laughs> exactly. Now, what do they say in our induction course? Don't use the air gun. Don't yeah. use the air gun on yourself. Even if you're doing a rock video for <laughs> yeah. Golden Rock. Nothing lasts forever. So, Paul, you're the naval architect. I am, yes. Excellent. Now, I'm intrigued by a couple of things. Mm hmm the raising of the deck and the moving of the engine back. Yes, yeah, so, well, I came into this project a little bit, when it was a little bit progressed. So basically I started off, I did the 3D scan of the boat, and then there was another architect engaged from Sydney, and uh, the decisions were made about the engine placement and the deck at that point. So yeah. that, was, that was a given, and it makes a lot of sense because basically, you know, you can see where the engine beds are yeah. in a prawn trawler, which she was working as, you know, the layout was completely different. The engine was on those beds, and then there was a um, there's a, a large fish hold just above the shaft now. Yeah. Right. So, okay. So that's um, you know you, you kind of prioritise space differently in a commercial vessel to a pleasure boat. Yeah. So that wasn't going to work from a, a, you know from Peter's perspective. And you can see also the damage done to that that shear clamp there. That is for, caused by the fish room. You can see it here, the timbers were uh, oxygen starved, and that's yep. what happens to it. Right, okay. Yeah. So there was quite significant damage. Oh, that's to interesting, it. right. So oxygen starvation causes yeah. that. Yeah. Yeah, so over you know, 20 or 30 years, that's what that's... It's funny, as a steel boat owner, you're like, get rid of the oxygen. Yeah, <laughs> like, you know, that's it's right. terrible. Yeah. Yeah, so that was it was all clad. I think it was a clad fish room, and that was yeah. So that's what was behind it. So I saw the boat initially first on. I thought this is going to take some work to get. <laughs> it was like, but Justin, when they got stuck into it, in yeah, three months time, it was a big, yeah. big difference. Yeah. yeah, it's huge, isn't it? Mm. I never saw it originally. I've never seen a photo yet, but uh, you can definitely see. Yeah, the amount of work that's gone into oh, it. Oh, absolutely. I called around when it was first. I'm like, this is just. You need to be really serious about this project. You can't just go. Oh, I'll just. You know, a bit of paint here, and it's not for the faint of heart. No, yeah, that's so. right. It was, yeah. So, no, they've done a great job. It's come a long way, not such a long time, really. 
Yeah. So, okay, so these these decisions were made before you came on board. Yeah. Uh, now, are you responsible for things like uh, stability down the track? Like, how does that work now? Yeah, so basically what we would do right now, um, I mean, we have a 3D model of the hull, so we know the shape. Yeah. Um, stability is not really a concern right now just because we don't know where the machine, well, we don't know where the final uh, floating of the boat will be. Yeah. Um, but she will definitely require ballast. So we'll yes. uh, basically what happens is we we measure the boat when it's all fitted out. We'll measure the boat uh, freeboards where she's floating. We'll do a stability analysis, and then we're okay. This boat really needs to be you know sitting down further, or you know we'll work out what the, what the trim yeah. issues are and impact on on stability, and then we'll get it to a point that you know it's good for safety. It's also good for comfort, and she's just sitting where she should be in the water. Yeah, nice. Which I would anticipate it's going to take at least seven or eight tons of ballast. I reckon. Wow. Yeah. It's almost the weight of my boat. And and really, it's a case of saying, all right, you've. I mean, I guess it's the thing. Go, oh, my engine's here, but oh, by the way, we used to have ten tons of fish in the back anyway, so... Yeah. Uh, and then you just trim it with your ballast as you... Yeah, so we're talking about, the conversation before was about the electrical system, which, you know, uh, I think we're going battery-driven electrical system. Mm -hmm. So that's primarily, um, the, the boat runs from batteries, which are then charged by various methods, such as solar and a dedicated battery charger, and the old man off the main engine. Um, so that will require a significant amount of battery capacity. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there's two ways. You can go lithium-ion or lead-acid. And due to the fact that we need a lot of weight, lead-acid will be the yeah. path we go to for that. And that Given sort of, how expensive lead is anyway. Yeah, exactly. So given how expensive lithium-ion batteries are as well. Yes. So lead-acid is actually a pretty good uh, road to go down if you've got room and weight, you know, you can mm -hmm. take the weight. There's plenty of room in the engine room. It's going to be, yeah. this bulkhead's coming back to somewhere here or something. Oh, okay, moving the bulkhead too, yeah. Yeah, so this needs to be clad anyway, it's sort of, you know, it needs to work on the ground. So they're going to take that out and then make the rudder room, basically, I think it's back to here. Mm -hmm. so you've still got a rudder room and a laser rep. Yeah. You've just got another 1.1 metres in the um, engine room. So it's a massive space. There's no problem with fitting a large battery bank fuel tanks and real equipment in here. But it's not really, it's not, there's going to be a lot of room in here that's not utilised really, not that much equipment on board. They don't have too much and too little. Yeah, that's right, yeah. So with, um, I, I, I was speaking to a guy, because my boat's quite tender, and, and, he, and he said to me that, probably not an issue with a boat like this, but he said, oh, if you're worried, like you said, you can do a bit of a test, he said, where you, you basically heal the boat over, yeah. and then time yeah. the, the sort of oscillation. Yeah, period test. Yeah, yeah right. So that's sort of a um, rough way of working out the stability of a vessel or the metacentric height. Yep. So on a boat like this, we, we could do that, and that's sort of a, an old-fashioned way of measuring trawler, like commercial trawler um, stability. It used mm -hmm. to be the way to pass standards. Nowadays, the standards are a little bit more um, uh, technically um, uh, demanding. We do a full inclination test. So basically on a boat this size, we probably have about um, like uh, one point four tonnes of weights and we'd move them about with the crane and mm -hmm. then we'd measure the heel angle at various um, stages of that of those movements. Oh, right, as you move it from the centre line and move yeah. it out, gotcha. Yeah, so we do fishing boats, well, I do fishing boats and weights regularly to commercial standards and mm -hmm. we produce a stability booklet from that. So that's how we would work out the stability characteristics. Yeah, nice. Okay. So it's, it'll be done to a, a commercial craft standard. Yes. Um, just because you need to have a standard, you can't just go, oh, the stability's okay. <laughs> it's okay because... It's okay-ish. Yeah, that's right. It's okay because it meets these standards, is what yeah. you have to say. So, yeah, that's how it's going to work with this as well. And so, it's been a long time since I've looked at it with your, your GZ and your what you know, yeah. your different so, so from those, when you look at the heel angle and the weight and how far it is from the centre, can you then calculate writing under the canoe or is it just a case of no at this way to this distance you're okay if you don't no no it's, yeah the, the the inclination experiment just allows me to work out and determine the vertical center of gravity of the vessel yep so once you know that then and we've got a 3d model of the vessel and we've measured displacement we're taking freeboard so we know mm -hmm. how much um how, how it's sitting in the water then with that information we work out the longitudinal and vertical centre of gravity of the boat mm -hmm. and how much water she's displacing. Yep. And then we do a stability curve for the whole time. Right, nice. So at every then we have an accurate model of the hull, of the deck house and any down flooding angles and things like that, and like down flooding points. So yes, yeah, right, like yeah. That. 
and then you do a whole stability curve, and then you work out the healing moments due to wind, passengers, if there's any lifting here or anything like that. So, yeah. and, and this is that's a standard sort of commercial analysis. Yeah, nice. And you produce a stability booklet. But, yeah. That's really cool. Uh, not that Peter really needs it, and he probably won't even look at it, but you still need to know that it's safe to operate in all conditions. And so how did you make your model? So we scanned the boat. It was a photogrammetry scan of the outside. Um, so it basically means you take about 1,200 um, digital photos. Mm -hmm. So um, 4K. They're going to be about 4K resolution. Wow. Um, and then you, you run it through a computer program. It stitches it all together into a three-dimensional map. Yeah, wow. And then we loft over a surface on that. Yep. So and that gives us a three D model, basically, to start with. And and from that you could you'd know depending on where it sits in the water, you can say right, well, there's your centre of buoyancy compared to your centre of mass. Or yeah, well, that's right. If you know where a boat sits, you know that you take freeboard in each corner. Yeah. You can then put a water plane in, mm -hmm. and then you immerse the model of that water plane. You can work out the immerse volume. Yeah, you well, know where the centre of gravity is longitudinally. Yeah. The only way you can determine the vertical centre of gravity is from an inclination to gravity. Gotcha. That's really cool. Right, it's got like the Archimedes principles. Yeah, yeah. Nothing new, but... but it's quite, yeah. Archimedes, what was he born about the 90s? Yeah, that's right. <laughs> but, yeah, but that's uh, for a YouTube guy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. But I actually think that's one of the things that makes it so appealing is there's the combination of this really traditional, old-school craft yeah. coupled with... 4D, you know, 1200 4K photos. Yeah, scan. like it's a, it's a nice blend of new and old. Oh, that's right. Yeah, and there's yeah, but that's kind of there's not really going to be too much of that high tech stuff applied really to. The, I mean, the electrical system is going to be pretty state of the art. You know, what we're discussing now is going to be, you couldn't do that 10 years ago. What we're talking about. Now. Wow. Okay. Yeah, because we're talking about running, you know, full household appliances. It's like an off-grid home, basically. Yeah, just some big inverters and big inverters. Yeah, big battery management system, so you can keep the battery you know, health up. You can yes. monitor everything, you know, and you've got the ability if you want to go to Papua New Guinea for you know a month, it's fine. Yeah. You, you can yeah. you can operate off completely yeah. unsupported. You yeah. know, as long as you've got diesel, you've got power, and you've got yes. about 1.5 tons of lead acid battery. battery yeah, it's going to be a, a lot of yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, it's a fair chunk, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, it is. Yeah, uh, very good. Well, thank you for your time. <laughs> no worries at all. Next up, we have a chat to Mark, one of the shipwrights on the project, about uh, both his time on the project and some of the joinery he's been doing, particularly with these new beams going into the carlins on the boat. So, Mark, you've, you've been on the job now for like a year or so, haven't yes, you? Yes, yeah. yeah and, yes. and there's been a lot of progress made. Um, one, of the, one of the questions I'd like to ask you is because it, 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 it sort of hopefully get an honest answer, which was when you first saw the boat and Justin said, I'd like you to come and help me on this boat. What did you think? I think maybe initially I thought, burn it. <laughs> <laughs> no, I need a joke. Look, uh, it wasn't a joke there, was it? She was pretty bad. Yeah. There was a lot of problems and there was a lot of areas that we thought would be problems that we couldn't actually access until we started yeah. and started getting into it. We, we didn't know how bad she really was. And probably the, the end of that journey was a better outcome yes. than what I first thought. Yes. But look, I've been involved in quite a few, you know, restoration projects over the years. And it's it's not always about that. It's about, for me, it's about the, the lines of the boat. Mm -hmm. And is the boat worth it? Because it's all work, you know, yeah. there's lots of work in yeah. all of it. And I will say, I mean, so I, I sail and typically I, I love sailing boats, you know, classic sailing yachts. And I sort of thought, timber trawler, you know, mm. is it sort of, is it, is it kind of going with the grain for me? But you know what? She's growing on me. Yeah. She is. It's interesting. And, and really some of the areas, like particularly where you come around the turn of the bilge and into the tuck when yes. we were doing the ribbing job, like some real challenges. You know, it's a fishing boat. Yes. But then you've got this beautiful sort of clipper bow. Yeah. And this lovely shear line. Yeah. Like, she, she is a real, real classic. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So worth saving. I, I think so. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so this is a half beam out of the Lisa Ann. This is what we were fitting yesterday. Mm -hmm. And I've just got an off cut here and I've just drawn uh, the cross section yep. of how this dovetail mm -hmm. would fit would fit into the carlin or a main beam. And that just, just shows how minimal the amount of timber that you, you so that's the part that you're taking out there yep. and on the vertical plane 
the beam is fully intact. Yeah, you still got the full full height and full width for various sections. That's right, because you imagine that, that all the all the forces coming this way. Yep. Because the deck's under compression from from above. Oh, sorry, Mark. Um, and and it creates like essentially like an angle. Mm -hmm. That that line there goes from 15 mil, which mm -hmm. with the width of my ruler I carry in my pocket. Yeah. Right. Because generally you don't measure, if you don't have to measure things, you use things that you can reproduce measurements with. So like yes. the width of a ruler or the yeah, width of Yeah, perfect. Something. Same every time. You know, uh, same and you can't time. misread it. And that's right. Yeah. So, so that's why that's that. And then you can imagine that that straight line through there, and then that distance up there should be an inch, which is the width of the ruler on the combination screen right. or the bevel gauge. Yeah. Um, and then you just, so you create that little step. So from underneath, you can't see anything and it stops the joint from falling through. Yep. But it makes it easy to cut. So when you cut, the only thing is when you cut this, you've got to cut from that point to this point with your saw. So it looks at something oh, yep. like that. Yes. And then to finish off this remaining little piece, you use like a, a multi-tool plunge cutting. Yeah, that one's, yeah. But I also bore in there with a force and a bit. So there's a, a few steps to the process to create that little sort of notch shape right there. Yep. And then you, as you can see, that's the, the opposite, that's what yeah. how it fits together. Yeah. And because of this wedge, it can't yes. slide out at all. Yes, so show that on the camera. So from above, it's a locking, it's a locking joint that that in compression can't fall through the bottom of the beam. Yep. Partly because of the step on the bottom, but also because of the, the angle here, because mm. it's a gain and fit, so as it goes down it tightens. Tightens and up. tightens, yeah. That's right. And it, and it can't, it locks itself in, it can't pull away from the member because of this. Because of this, yeah. yeah. But these half beams will also have, between the beam shelf, which is on this side, and the carlin on this side, tie rods yes. that go through. I think I saw a stainless tie rod already on Correct. Pete's boat, yeah. yeah we, we're just using all thread on this job yeah. um, because it's going to be lined and you don't see it, but if they were to be seen, you'd use copper. Right, nice. Just, yeah. just, a, just a nicer sort yeah. of a, a look. If it's, yeah. if it's visible, yeah. Mark's original trade was actually as a furniture maker, and here you can see an example of a beautiful bit of boat furniture he's made where he's taken some modern gas struts and built a sort of bespoke table around that out of timber did some really lovely work. Anyway, time came to drive home and get back to the real world. So we're back, we made it. <laughs> England lost, but we still oh, made another scape. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, so you don't see the boat, you know, every few months or so. Yeah. Uh, what did you think of the progress? Look, really good. And what is really outstanding to me is that, and this is, you know, fairly, I can imagine, common practice, that the standard of joinery, mm -hmm. once they get to putting the deck together and the and the wheelhouse, is a lot higher than when they're just planking and yes. putting in ribs. And, and the... <laughs> it's completely different. And I, you know, if I extrapolate that to what I'd expect in the interior, I'm very excited by, yeah. by what it's going to be I was like. going to say, because to see how perfect the joinery is, below the deck that you'll never see. Mm -hmm. yeah. I think if that's how good it is when no one ever gets to yeah. see it again, what's the interior going to be like? Yeah. yeah. Did you ever consider a production boat before going down? Yeah, the... I've, looked at a lot of, I've looked at a lot of boats over the years. Yes. Yeah. And, you know, either the time's not been right or the price has not been right. Yeah. And look, to get a boat that you're really going to use, you, you need to have the money, but you really also got to have the time. And that, that's quite often the hardest part. Yeah. You know? Yeah, because one deprives you of the other in some exactly. ways. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, and then okay, so you have considered various production boats, but what made you ultimately decide to convert and restore a trawler? Yes, well, I, I, I wanted a trawler hub. Yeah. And you know, the, the, you can either convert a steel or a wooden trawler, and I was probably really leaning towards steel. Okay. Yeah. Um, or you could buy a boat which would be generally fiberglass. Yes. Um, Look, the best trawlers um, that are not too old are really are very expensive. Right. And when you look at the, con the price of a conversion, it's, it's a lot less. You right. know, you yeah. can, and, and the way I'm doing the conversion, because the boat was so bad in the first place, <laughs> look, we really are going to end up with a brand new boat. Yes. Because everything's going to be new on the boat. Yeah. And um, I think that... You know, I think people are aware that conversion's cheaper. Mm -hmm. I think they sometimes make the mistake 
thinking it's more cheap than it really is. Like yes. it's not cheap. No. It's expensive, but it's not as expensive as you know going for a new boat. Yes. Yeah. And the other benefit is, like, by the time this boat gets delivered, I'm going to know an awful lot about it. Oh, you're not inside out. Yeah. yeah, you're so, although you're not necessarily down there swinging a chisel, you're so actively involved in the process yeah, that absolutely. every decision, every... And then I guess also you, um, uh, you know, you get a lot of say in the layout, so it ends up the boat that suits yes. you and the way you want to use the boat yes. instead of just... And there is a big difference between the yeah. way people want to use boats. I mean, yeah. I've seen a lot of boats that I really like, that are great boats, but maybe the cabin configuration's not what I'd want, or, yes. you know, there's, there's very often just, it's not even necessarily a big thing, but you don't want to have to spend money on something that's already done. Yes. You know, you're better off to That's start. not, particularly if it's not to your taste. Correct, yeah. And it seems that the, um, what's particularly special about this restoration is um, your traditional trawler conversion is extend the cabin back over the work deck and not much more yeah where you've both uh moved the engine back and raised the deck to make internal space so it's probably the most complete trawler conversion i've ever seen mm. yeah you know, so i think that's uh important as you said if you go to buy a boat and somebody's done that uh cabin extension you've actually got more things to undo as yes. opposed to as opposed to being ahead of the game yes i mean the, the, the problem of half half doing half conversion is you you do end up with a lot of significant compromises yes um i mean one of the things i realized or we realized was that we we're going to have to replace the deck for example yeah. and you know we came up with the idea of actually making the deck high making the new deck yeah. high which makes an enormous difference to particularly to the headroom underneath ah, yeah. but also you know, I think that if you look at the shape of the boat, the original shape of the boat, it can take another 300 mils yeah. deck height because these decks are built very low yeah. in the back. Whereas if you look at a, like a passage maker trawler, like a Lord Harbour, the decks are very high off. There's a lot of free board. A yeah. lot of free board. Yeah. 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 So, you know, that was a decision we made and it wasn't an easy decision. But in the end, the shipwrights decided that in some ways it was going to be easier to build a new deck that was higher than the old deck yeah. because they could leave the old deck down and they could stand on it while they were building the new yeah, deck. Yeah, it's interesting, isn't the it? Deck out. It's actually a, a bonus to them, not a... Well, it was, they were benefits, yeah. Yeah, 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 exactly. So I've only got one other question. Who's that guy standing <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I thought he was a friend of yours. No, no, he's a friend of yours. You can see he's just there. <laughs> well, thank you for taking us along and hopefully we'll get another chance yeah. to see it in a few yeah. months' time and for we'll keep track of the progress. Yeah, great. And, uh, and then we'll maybe try and uh, talk our way into helping deliver it. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Ben. Well, thanks for watching. I hope you enjoyed. We'll definitely be seeing this boat again as the project progresses. I'm still working on the uh, freshwater cooled outboard with the closed cooling system. Lots been happening there, so it won't be so long until the next video. This was definitely a bit of a break that was uh, much longer than I intended. Anyway, take care. I'll catch you soon. Ish. See ya. Someone wants in, someone wants out. Cockatoo wants in to get your food, you want out. Tell a run around. Not that you're very good at running. Let's go uh, putting into this Mexican standoff. You didn't go very far, did you? Come on, Daffy, out you come.